Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. We're delighted to see and hopefully hear from you all today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host, moderator, and cat herder for the next hour. And today we'll be exploring the future of education and technology with a terrific guest. Before we proceed, uh, let me begin with an introduction to forum. We'll explain what it is, how it works, where it came from, and then we'll start with this week's guest. So to begin with, you should know that the forum is a discussion-oriented time. This is uh, all about conversation. What I'm doing right now, we showing you one video. It's something I'm only, I wouldn't, uh, PowerPoint is something I'm only going to do for just a minute. Um, the real job here is to show you um, conversation so that people could have discussion with each other. Uh, this comes out of the Future Trends in Technology and Education project. Uh, that's a monthly report, a trends analysis that follows uh, almost 90 major trends across education and technology. It's been going on for about six years. If you haven't seen it before, just go to ftte.us and you can learn more. Uh, and that's the basis of that. We're trying to take a look at the major trends in the present that are shaping the future of education and technology. Now, the Future Trends Forum and the FTTE report are part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is a multimedia, continuous, ongoing, discussion-based exploration of where education could be going. So it includes the FTTE report, it includes this forum right now, as well as a blog, as well as a book club and a bookstore, and some more things coming up soon. So if you haven't seen that, just go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do this work uh, with the support of some generous people and entities. We want to thank them right now before proceeding. So first of all, I'd like to thank NYSERNET from New York State. That's a nonprofit that helps that state's colleges, universities, along with museums, clinics, and libraries, get on the broadband internet and do great things together. Uh, they do fantastic work, and we're really grateful to NYSERNET for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig, because you can tell Shindig makes available this very technology we're using. So let me just take a minute to show you how this works, if you're new to it or if you haven't been here for a while. So first of all, where I am, and where this slide is here, just for a minute, this is called the stage. And it's called that because you can see and hear everything that comes up here. Now right below me right now is a string of people. If you look around, you can see some uh, silhouettes, uh, like I mean, Franks. You can see some video feeds, like Doyle Frisley. And each one of those represents either one person or one sign-in from somewhere in the world. Now, if you see somebody else, another silhouette or person that you'd like to have a chat with, you can simply double-click on them. And if they want to talk to you, their icon will move right next to yours. They'll click together like Legos. You'll have your own private audio-visual bubble, which is pretty neat. But if you'd like to talk to everybody here, if you'd like to join the general conversation, let me show you a few different ways. Look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a white strip running along it. That has a few different buttons. Let me show you how these work. On the far left edge, you'll see a button that has a number. Uh, right now, I think it's 35. And it has a few human head silhouettes and a little box next to it. If you click that, up will pop two different boxes. The one on the left will be a kind of film strip view of all the participants. So you can just mouse over and learn a little bit more about each one. Rick Crane is the ACIO, Enterprise Information Systems at the University of North Georgia, for example. That's pretty handy. On the right, you'll see a little chat box. And that's simply a classic chat box where you can text chat to about, uh, let's see, 20 or 18 or so people who have logged in around the same time as you. Uh, and we found this is a great way for people to have informal conversation. Uh, sometimes if people mention a website or an article or a book, someone will paste in a reference or a URL for it. Uh, other times people will surface ideas, questions, comments they have. And it's a good way to start surfacing some questions for the uh, guest, as well as for myself. Uh, so that chat box is one way to do it. Now, if you look back at that white strip, you'll see next to the chat box button, there's a question mark with a circle around it. If you click that, it will pop a little box, and you can type in a question or a comment. And when the time is right, I'll flash that on the screen for everyone to see. Then I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. And that's a pretty good tool if you're in a hurry or if your microphone and camera don't work uh, or if you're in a space where you can't be having a conversation out loud. Now, if all those things are actually true, if you do have good headphones and a good microphone, good camera, and you can talk out loud, then go back to that white strip and press my favorite button, the 
raise hand button. That tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. And it's really easy. Just by clicking that, you get into a list, and when time is ready, I hit upload it. Up you come and you join us on stage. In fact, we can have up to four people here on the stage at one time. So me, the guest, and two of you. And we consider that a kind of pop-up panel. And we can have that conversation going. So through that video, through the text box, through the chat box, those are three different ways that you can get your thoughts across and into the whole mix of conversation. Please take advantage of those and use whichever one is comfortable. Now, if that's not enough, if that isn't enough choices, you can head to Twitter. And all you have to do is use the hashtag FTTE. And I'll be monitoring that throughout, and I'll surface any questions or comments that come through there. Now, those are all the ways you can talk. Those are all the ways you can participate. And we are really grateful to Shindig for making this technology available. We're also grateful to another population, and that's our supporters on Patreon. Now, if you haven't seen Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter or GoFundMe where you can contribute to support people who are making creative projects. In this case, it's us making this creative project about the future of education. And you can see here from the screen that we have a whole bunch of folks who've been kicking in as little as a dollar a month just to keep all the lights on, the machines humming. Uh, folks like Matthew Henry, Erwin Davies, uh, Laura Armour, Bob Johnson, Kyle Johnson, Michael Haggins, Matthew Henry, Sean Summer, all kinds of great people, Corey S. We're really grateful to them for, to them for their support. If you'd like to join them, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, and we'd love to see you there. So that's who supports this. That's how the technology works. That's where we came from and what we're about. Now let me introduce this week's guest. Over the past nearly three years, we've been discussing the topic of automation and education frequently for a wide range of areas. We've looked at AI, we've looked at automation in the classroom, we've looked at the possibilities of robotics, but today we want to take a deep dive into one particular real-world use of technology for teaching. I'm really pleased to announce and introduce Jamie Height. He's the co-founder and CEO at Acre, uh, which is a bit of software that helps a student writer write more effectively and more powerfully, and also it builds an assessment. This is a really extraordinary project, and I really want to make sure that we have a chance to explore. So I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Jamie, uh, I'd like to bring him up on stage, and I'd like to make sure that you all get a chance to ask questions of him as we go. Now, um, as we do this, remember to use all of the different conversational options we have. You can press the uh, button for chat, for a text question, or join us up here on stage. Welcome, Jamie. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. As I mentioned, I'm well, excited to have a chat. Well, I'm delighted to have you here. And uh, I just realized there's a trend that's been happening now for about a year, which is every other guest has a terrific beard. Um, and I think that's a, that, that's becoming a, a maybe a prerequisite for being a guest. So I, I just want to thank you for your wonderful chase and uh, facial grooming. Well, uh, my younger daughter has been pointing out with the relative consistency the amount of white that is showing up in my... Oh, no. <laughs> trying to oh. explain to her the importance of social graces and not pointing out such characteristics. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's good to be here and uh, certainly looking for understanding <laughs> everybody's different affiliations. This looks like a sharp group, so I'm excited to, to hear what folks have to say. It really is a sharp group. And what you have to, the, the milestone you have to look forward to is when people call you Santa Claus, especially when kids do it. That's the... <laughs> That'll be it. That'll be the big push. Um, now, let me just ask, I just really briefly introduced you by your title and by your creation role behind Decree. Um, why don't you tell us a bit more about yourself uh, in terms of um, what you work on, uh, where you're based, and what you look forward to for 2019? Sure. Uh, so my name's Jamie. I am a former teacher in uh, the higher ed space. I taught my first English composition course way back in 2002 taught by mm -hmm. calendar year about 13 years worth by credit hour I'm close to 25 across humanities disciplines I wrote my PhD on Emily Dickinson a very ah. highly technological subject uh, perfectly congruent with what I do now and happy birthday a couple of days in advance to Emily she's uh, yes. tense is coming up and uh, you know ultimately 
I left the classroom because I didn't see the point in grading a lot of papers. I knew I didn't like it. There were certainly a lot of them. And kind of set out on the journey to figure out a better way to help students because I didn't feel like I was doing a particularly good job of it at where I was supposed to be doing that, which is in the classroom. So that's kind of how Acree came into existence. So I'm not the technical wizard. I do acknowledgement to my co-founder, Dr. Robin Donaldson. He knows uh, far, far more about computers than I could ever hope to. Uh, so he's kind of the, the wizard who deserves the credit for cracking the code, as it were. Uh, we're based in North Carolina, which I was complaining about our cold snap, though, based on some of the comments. I need to stop because <laughs> relative to others in the room, it's not cold here, uh, though it certainly feels cold. And we are looking forward to uh, to growth and acceptance in 2019. Uh, this is an important technology involved in an important educational goal, which is how do we get more students to write better? Uh, so we're, we're excited, ready to close out the year and start a, another one, get off to, get off to a fast start for 2019. Excellent. Excellent. Um, friends, I, I'm going to ask Jimmy a few questions, but, uh, the real purpose here is for you to ask yours. Um, so as I start interrogating our, our poor guest, um, please think of the questions that come up. And I've often found that it helps to think about questions based on where you are. Uh, not so much geographically, but say, for example, your institutional position. Uh, are you an educational technologist? Or are you an academic dean? Or are you a faculty member who teaches writing? Do you work at a paracurricular center, such as a research center? Uh, and ask you know, a question based on that or based on your experience um, of involved with writing or with automation or with both. Um, Jimmy, you know, we sent out announcements about this and gave people links to Ecree, so I'm going to assume people had a chance to at least click on that. Um, why don't you tell us a bit more how Ecree works once it's installed, once uh, a campus has access to it? Um, so from the front end, if you were, from the perspective of instructors and students, what does Ecree do for them? Sure. No, it's a great question. Happy to answer. So Acree is entirely web-based. Uh, so mm -hmm. anybody who has access to the internet can have access to the technology. Uh, and Acree is owned, quote unquote, by the teacher. So a teacher can set up questions in his or her class. Uh, it's also possible, of course, for a central administrator to set up questions. Uh, and the whole purpose of the technology, regardless of kind of the teacher or the admin or the discipline is to get students formative writing practice. I always like to emphasize this was conceptualized, designed, and developed as a formative resource. You know, simply put, students need to write more. There's a very specific reason I never assigned my students any more writing than I absolutely had to. It's because of the obligation to grade the papers that went with sure. that, and I can do math. I know I don't have a whole lot of extra time, so... Uh, you know, unlimited drafts is just not feasible. I don't scale. Uh, unfortunately, expertise in terms of teachers does not scale. Uh, students need something scalable because they need to spend a lot more time doing it. Uh, so that was kind of the pedagogical approach here is just get them to write. And then more specifically what the technology does, and I believe we'll have a video of people want to see a snippet of this actually working. Uh, is just giving students real-time feedback on the basic elements of good academic writing. Uh, you know, so much of the process uh, is I learned to do it and then uh, did it when I was in the classroom was students will turn in my, uh, turn in a paper to me, I will take it away and give it back to them with hopefully a fair number of comments, hopefully within a week, uh, but more often than not, it stretched beyond a week and my comments yeah. were a lot of short. So targeted specific feedback on very basic things as they're working. Yeah, and if you can provide that kind of base level engagement with students, they're going to start to master concepts uh, and practice them. So when my human brain actually does kind of become part of the process, and uh, it's a second point to emphasize as an aside, is this wasn't created as a replacement. It's not magic. Uh, it does one thing really, really well. There's still additional uh, conceptual things that human brains can do that I don't think technology will ever be able to do. Uh, you know, if students are getting more formative practice with the technology from wherever they are, you know, dorm room, library, phone, we do see a lot of students who will type out 1,000 word essays on a mobile phone, which I don't understand as a, you know, a child. <laughs> I won't date myself, but a child who now has white in his beard, the idea of punching out a paper on a phone has always confused me. 
but you know they can get that access uh, to feed time, uh, feedback in real time so that when I, the teacher, actually engage with them, I can be much more targeted in terms of helping students along. And as a consequence of that practice, they will have gotten what I'm going to be working with is almost always going to be of a better quality than uh, if I if students hadn't had that kind of initial formative engagement. Uh, so I'll hit so I create so I create enhances the instructor's role. It empowers the instructor to do more, provide a better writing experience for the students. Yeah, and it's designed to take the part of the job that the instructor doesn't like to do off his or her plate. You know, the grading part. Uh, yeah, basketball season is a big deal here in Durham and. Uh, I actually got to go to a game recently. It was my first one. It was preseason, so not uh, apparently a match that mattered. But, you know, Coach K, he makes how many millions of dollars coaching basketball? So I was watching him. I was like, what is he doing that gets him these massive, massive checks? Like, what, what is his job? And what was fascinating is he didn't do anything in the sense of he just sat there and watched. You know, and he had assistance for everything else going on around him. And the point, of course, is that he has a system to do all the grunt work, and then he just sits and does pretty advanced strategic stuff in his brain. And that's kind of a good way of thinking about how we built a Cree. It's you know, something to do those parts of the job that teachers don't like to do so that they can do more of what a computer can't do. Uh, so it, it's a, a complement, not a, a replacement. Excellent. Um, uh, friend, I'm going to have more questions, but to... Uh, to help stoke your fury or your desire for questions. Uh, let me, uh, will this be a good time, Jamie, to show this uh, one minute clip of uh, Ecranian use? Sure, uh, if you can fire it up. Oh, we can. Uh, do you want to introduce this and explain what we'll be, what we'll be looking at? Uh, yeah, so what I sent over was about a minute or so of a screen capture of say a four or five minute video that walks through uh, the composition of a I believe it's a process essay I sent. Uh, you know, so a pretty basic writing task. Describe the process. I think in this case, it's making French press coffee. Uh, the entire exercise for the student is just to take something and explain it and get them to think, how do you explain something in a logical, organized way? Uh, and so what you're going to see is uh, the ICRI algorithm and the ICRI product uh, giving the student feedback on his or her process essay. And there uh, are a couple mistakes that were intentional that in fixing them are meant to demonstrate the dynamic and real-time nature of the technology. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this and see how the student does with the French press. That is read as well throughout the paper. This indicates to the student that a process statement needs to be added, and that process statement needs to make explicit mention of the number of steps that will be discussed. So the student sees this and says, well, it takes 100 steps to make coffee that tastes like something you can get in a New York cafe. After the student makes the changes, the algorithm will identify, yes, there is a process statement. Yes, there's a stated number of steps. So we do have a process statement present, but the stated number of steps is too many. There's no way a student can discuss 100 steps about making French press coffee, so the student needs to do more work. We're going to change 100 steps to 5 steps. And again, in a couple of seconds, the system will provide updated feedback and again, in a couple that of shows steps, the students' changes were successful. Feedback. We still have our process statement. That shows we have the number of steps, and we have a sentence indicating the specific steps that matches that number. And over on the right, we see the students' feedback shifted over to all green for this introduction. Further, so. That was an example of, of a student trying to write through a Cree and succeeding and getting live feedback. How, I got to ask, how does this work? That's a that's a pretty impressive bit of uh, coding. Uh, so yeah, I, and again, I'll emphasize technically. I I don't understand it. It's it's super detailed level how it works because I'm not a computer scientist, but I can certainly describe the approach that we took. Uh, you know, and the goal in building the engine. Uh, from my co-founder's perspective and from my perspective as a teacher is you know, to have some kind of clear pedagogical impact. So how do we actually help students get better? And the answer we came up with uh, was to move away from existing approaches to this type of technology, uh, what's called a pattern-based approach for using traditional machine learning. And I can certainly come back to that if folks are interested. Uh, and we set out to uh, build a rules-based engine. Uh, so to answer your question, 
Uh, how does it do that? It being the algorithm takes the rules of good writing uh, and looks for them in the paper just as I would. So in the process essay, you should have, uh, you know, process statement, I'm going to discuss X and the number of steps, and then you should have a statement that lists the steps, and those steps should correspond with the order that you talk uh, about different things in. Uh, so it's really the rules of good writing that drive, uh, drive the technology. And the rules are what I like to call just a basic rubric, a standard rubric. Uh, technically, it's a composite rubric, meaning we collected more than 200 rubrics from around the country, you know, looked at state standardized tests, APs, TOEFL, uh, random departments in all different types of higher education institutions. And I laid them all out on my floor. And I said, well, how do I create something that's 90% plus similar to every single one of these documents? You know, my wife was like, what are you doing? And I said, I, I promise it makes far more sense than it probably looks like it does. And the, the exercise wasn't as difficult as I would have expected because there's a general consensus about what foundational academic writing looks like. And we've spent centuries in our intellectual and cultural tradition. You state your position, you support it with information, and then you... Uh, summarize your argument, uh, had some relevant concluding thoughts. You know, relative weights, uh, that we don't worry as much about. That's a bit more art than science. So any metric might vary in terms of the percent of the overall grade that uh, this metric inputs into the overall score. But the concepts of good writing, those are pretty standard. Uh, and that's, again, coming back to that formative approach here. The goal is to get students to understand how to utilize those basic concepts regardless of what they're writing. Uh, do you have a photo of uh, that huge living room floor covered with all the different images? Uh, I do. I, don't have I should have sent you one. Um, That'd be great, was, just as the history of it. <laughs> the, uh, I showed you what I was doing wow. with my spare time a few years ago. It's an interesting exercise. So a student, um, is a student going to be using this when they are writing outside of class or inside of class or both or either? Uh, we see both. The, uh, if I had to say there's a typical use case, it's going to be a student writing outside the context of a class. Uh, but we certainly see instances where teachers will be giving their students uh, prompts off uh, on the fly in uh, what I assume is a computer lab. So they're having an in-class writing assignment. Uh, and to come back to the technical distinction I made just a second ago between a rules-based engine and a pattern-based mm -hmm. engine, uh, you know, one of the really powerful features of what a CRE does through its rules-based approach is that you don't have to train it, you know, meaning I don't, as a teacher, have to give it hundreds of exemplar papers to set it up. I can add questions literally in 30 seconds, so I can come in if I'm teaching political science 101 and say, let's discuss the implications of you know, this Chinese executive being arrested in Canada, go. Uh, I can literally set that up in 30 seconds and students can start typing on their machines. Uh, and that really gives, you know, gives control to the teacher for him or her to kind of leverage this formative resource in their class, which they know far better than I uh, obviously could ever know. Like education remains a pretty localized thing uh, and teacher-student interaction, you know, the foundation of this massive infrastructure that exists. So you know, another one of our design principles, and this is kind of my own bias coming through, is forever thinking about it from the teacher's perspective. You know, put myself back in that classroom. Is this something that I would have liked? And if not, why not? And we don't do the things that I answer no, I would not have liked this uh, to the extent possible. Sometimes there's technical realities that, uh, you know, you, again, algorithms aren't magic. They do have parameters. But within those parameters, uh, always emphasizing you know, make people's lives better, meaning teachers uh, have control over it and students get that practice. Uh, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, friends, I was about to say, this is a good time for your questions, but we already had one that just popped up. Um, and let me just say, again, if you have a, a question, you can either use the uh, chat box uh, or you can use the uh, video uh, raised hand, and I can beam me up on stage. Or you can ask a question uh, like we had just now. This is from uh, uh, hang on. Um, this is from Aaron Schreier uh, at Southern New Hampshire, who asks: Can existing papers be uploaded to a CRE, or do students compose within the program? Good question, Aaron. 
Uh, it is a great question, and the answer is either or. So students can uh, upload, they can drag and drop from their desktop, or they can start composing uh, from scratch. Anytime they're active in the system, the system saves the work and preserves it. Uh, so one of the consequences that I didn't anticipate uh, that's turned out to be uh, a huge value add is just as a submission system that's reliable, because uh, anything that happens in the system is caught. So students can't ever claim, you know, my work disappeared. Like, well, no, it's right there. And you can go download it, right? We don't hold anything captive. Students can always export their work. Uh, and most students, I would say, probably start with a draft from outside the system. Uh, with the exception of the, the mobile phone users, again, are the ones who will start composing within. Um, but it's designed to get, uh, again, as many people into the system from as many different directions so that they can get to work on what, on what ultimately matters, which is practicing their writing. And getting the feedback. Uh, do you have a mobile app, or do people just use a, a web app version? Uh, it's all web app, so there is no mobile app. Mm. Uh, you know, we don't mm. have to worry about iOS or Android. Uh, so it's just nice. one piece of technology all run through the web. Uh, the only kind of technical limitation we ever run into is the random occurrence of someone using a version of Internet Explorer from 2004. So, <laughs> so it does include <laughs> a somewhat contemporary browser, uh, and we're constantly updating the front end to cast as wide a net on different devices and browsers as we can. Uh, we can't catch them all, but we do catch most of them. Again, in connection to the Internet, that's your uh, sort of your ticket uh, to get into the show. What's the uh, bandwidth demand for it? In terms of yeah, how hitting the internet. Many, um, I mean, it's, is it like streaming like, live three? Is it like streaming live video, or is it like um, you know downloading a chat or what? Uh, it's much closer to a chat than streaming a video. Uh, it's pretty light in terms of data. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a largely text-driven application, uh, so students aren't going to be chewing through their data policies. We do offer the ability for teachers to record videos and embed those uh, as kind of make feedback feel more familiar. Some people do some really interesting work as an aside, uh, but those aren't obligatory. So if I had a thesis statement video explaining to my students, this is how you do it, uh, that's not the default. The default is always a textual piece of feedback so that the data load uh, is as light as it can possibly be by default. Nice. That's really good, especially. Oh, that's sorry. Another question I wanted to ask: Is this aimed at post-secondary, K through twelve, graduate school, all of the above? Uh, it's a great question, and it's one we are still actively researching. Uh, so I'll explain that. It was designed for higher education, and that's because that's the world I came out of, <laughs> in the very acute pain uh, I knew. Uh, what became pretty clear pretty quickly is that high school students could benefit just as much. Uh, and statistically, high school students actually benefit slightly more on average than college students. Uh, so there, uh, there is kind of an upper limit beyond which the signal uh, weakens in terms of impact. You know, if you're writing a 20-page senior thesis on Kant, uh, you're probably not going to get as much out of it as an English comp student writing about Romeo and Juliet. Uh, there's still uh, kind of super small tech benefits, but uh, presumably at that point, we don't need it. And likewise, we're actively probing how early uh, the technology can be effective. Uh, so we're seeing good data in middle school, and we're pushing into fourth and fifth grade, because that's when fourth and fifth wow. graders start writing long-form essays for standardized tests. My assumption mm -hmm. is that that'll probably be too early, not because of the technology, but just the intellectual aptitude of a fourth grader to be able to read something, process it, and apply it. That's a skill that a fourth grade brain may not be able to, to complete with consistency. Uh, but we're, we're looking at answering that question. Uh, so yeah, anytime you're Thanks. writing a long form essay, it's going to be relevant. And we also, I should say, I forgot to mention this in the overview, we have different rhetorical modes. So it's not just uh, your standard expository or argumentative essay. We uh, have a single paragraph component, so uh, just kind of lower level, one paragraph stuff to provide the same type of engagement, yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions that came in, so let me put some of these up for you. Um, and I we have a question as an aside. No, I'm, I'm putting them up right now. This okay, is from uh, Charlie Doyle, a student. Hey, Charlie, who asks, can your system check for purely grammar mistakes? Uh, yeah, we have uh, spelling and grammar as a component of how we assess paper. So there is a spelling and grammar functionality built in. 
uh, what I always tell people is that's not what we started out to build. Uh, so if that's your core focus, Grammarly is a much better product for you because it's a much more robust engine. Uh, we do have that functionality within our platform. That's something that's constantly improving and getting stronger. Uh, but if you're worried just about grammar, uh, you know, we're not the best resource. We're focused on that kind of second level uh, of writing, teaching, organization, argumentation, use of evidence analysis. Okay. And that was Grammarly, which uh, uh, we've seen before. We have another question. Um, and this is from uh, Dan Lasota, who asks, how does your system know what the assignment is about? Does an instructor have to know any symbolic language in setting up an assessment? Good question. Uh, it is a good question. Actually, I anticipated this one. So if you want, I'm just going to show you if that's OK. Now, hold on a second. I'm going to sign in and then do a screen share. As I right. learned, I can't do two things at once. Uh, when it comes to, uh, hold on just a second. Sorry, my fat fingers, my cold fingers here in the- Very cold, yes. Georgia, North Carolina winter. Uh, so let me, the share screen button, where are you? Brian, can you, is it on my panel here? Uh, let me see. Um, I did it yesterday and I've forgotten. Okay. Um, Turner, can you oh, give me a hand here? I, can. I got it. You got it? All right. Uh, so everyone can. OK. So we've got the screen. Uh, and we've got the sign in. So here's the you know, adding the assignment. And here are the different questions you have available. Assignment type. Uh, so let's do a yeah, personal narrative essay. Uh, the interactive editor is the technology we uh, technology that we saw that short video of, you know, probably 95% of questions use it, but you're not obligated to, uh, meaning if the teacher wants to just have feedback after a submission, you are able to do that, but we're going to, uh, you know, something simple. It's an English comp class, first semester, and you just want to ask your students to write a reflection paper. Why did you decide to go to college? You know, if you have, need to add personal uh, You can always add additional notes to the student, but I've typed in my question, I click submit, you'll see it's been added, and if you watch behind, uh, it's in the system. So that's uh, how easy it is to set it up. Wow, that was pretty slick. Yeah, yeah so bring uh, back. to answer the question. Um, does that, uh, uh, Dan, does that help? Uh, let us know. I think um, that was a really neat demo of uh, bringing that up. Uh, and it was pretty easy. No symbolic language needed at all. Uh, we had a quick question from Neela, who wants to know, is this accessible outside the United States? Uh, yeah, with um, a quasi exception. So it's because it's internet based, as long as you can get online, you can use it. So we do have students using it around the world. Uh, and the only occasional reason that students can't use it is China because mm. uh, you know, the Great Firewall sometimes yeah. catches us. We made some architectural changes that have resolved that problem for the most part, but uh, if you're looking in, you know, for a Beijing use case, I can't guarantee you it's always going to work. Uh, but other than that, anywhere you can get online, you can access the system. Understood. Good question. Uh, I hope that addresses it, Mila. It's impressive to think that Yakri is already a global phenomenon. Um, we have a, uh, <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. Uh, we have a question from uh, Aaron Schreier who asks, is this designed to be a single user experience or could, for instance, a writing tutor invite his or her student to work through some writing during a synchronous online experience? Interesting question. Uh, so it's a great question. Yeah, no, we, um, and we've gotten some version of this uh, more and more recently. And the short answer is no, because uh, the initial design assumed a teacher or uh, a, a TA kind of quote unquote running the system, meaning controlling uh, entering of questions. Uh, so what's going on in terms of writing centers now, uh, you know, the writing center tutors can still act as the teacher, uh, but there's enough interest that we're designing uh, a, a different user type who can kind of own the questions and work uh, in a more collaborative way with uh, students. Something uh, that's probably going to be closer to a peer to peer type interface rather than the 
the student teacher distinction, uh, but we'll get there. It's an active conversation uh, right now is how to expand the, you know, the number of use cases within a, a typical educational environment where people can get together and work on what needs to be worked on. Would it be fair to say the, the default setting is individual students working with the software? Uh, yes, in conjunction with some type of educator or administrator setting up the question. Yeah. So students can't you know, log in independently. We do assume that a teacher is going to uh, have set things up. Uh, we did a, some experiments with a student-directed use of the technology. Uh, and as you might guess, the results were highly variable because uh, the ability to add correct inputs was highly variable. Oh, I'd like to hear more about that. But, but first, we have uh, uh, Catherine Kazem. Um, Catherine, can you hear us? Hi. I can, can you hear me? Yes, uh, perfectly. Yes, well, terrific. Um, well, thank you. I'm, I'm myself a recovering English professor, and there was hey. nothing more in the world that I hated than, uh, quote, grading papers. Um, but I felt a little dismayed um, as I was watching this because I was very intrigued by the uh, technology, which I thought looks very promising. But whenever somebody says this, this is designed to make the job of the teacher easier, or this is really about the teacher. Um, I feel this sort of sadness that um, we're basically still looking at a very closed system in which students are learning to write things that have relatively little um, relevance in the outside world. They don't have any readers. You know, it's sort of still about the the, the teacher. And um, kind of curious about your thoughts. I've been seeing more and more. I, I was just at a. Um, uh, Reimagine Education Conference um, in San Francisco, and kept having the feeling that there was sort of 21st century technology, but kind of 20th century and sometimes even 19th century ideas about learning. Um, so yeah. I was wondering if you've had any of these thoughts yourself, and and if you see a way to address them. Sure. Uh, yeah. The short answer is I have them all the time, both in a professional and an intellectual capacity. I got mm. my PhD in the UK, so I'm. In some ways, I'm as old school as they come. I like the idea of the one-on-one -on -one relationship and thinking expansively and uh, letting the thesis emerge out of reading widely and deeply. Uh, yeah, that's that's not incongruent at its core with the 21st century world, but it's certainly different. Uh, the pace mm -hmm. of our world now is uh, far faster, and therefore, you know, the the ability to reflect deeply on a Shakespeare play. Uh, that skill as taught needs to quote unquote translate much better into the realities that students will face uh, in, uh, in a digital environment. And this is a conversation I have quite frequently with uh, writing center directors, with colleagues who still teach. You know, how do we make the humanities uh, relevant? And you know, part of it is you know, a willingness to say that things need to change. I'm mm -hmm. trying to pick my words carefully. Uh, but we can't live in the 19th century because that's not the way the world works anymore, right? Uh, we need uh, an intellectual apparatus that can thrive in that faster-paced world. Uh, you know, the ability to collect information, to think about it, and to speak to it uh, quickly, structured uh, in a structured way, in an organized capacity. Uh, and that's kind of my bridge across these two worlds, is that the, the underlying skills that writing is about are, for my money, always going to be applicable. But if I give you a problem, can you think mm -hmm. about it, come up with a solution, and then tell me about it? And I don't care if it's, you know, is King Lear mad, or I'm your sales director, and I need you to give me a report on this week's activity of the new product launch, right? Here's the task. I want you to think about it and give me the information I need in a clear, um, thoughtful way. I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I actually... I'm very pro Shakespeare, <laughs> um, but my, my concern is that um, first of all, we're I, I mean, when you mentioned TOEFL, and I worked at ETS for ten years, so believe me, I know those five paragraph essays, mm -hmm. uh, and what we used to call uh, Korea in spring term because Korean students were taught um, a certain way to write these essays, and they all yeah. always involved Korea in spring time. Um, <laughs> five paragraph essay really has no relevance in any universe outside of the English, um, the composition wow. classroom. I mean, 
Wow. Now, it's very important to understand how to build on paragraphs or to write coherent paragraphs or to introduce what you're writing. All of that, I think, is great. But we spend too little time, it seems to me, waiting for the miracle to occur, you know, that, that we, we sort of expect the miracle to occur in which people will be able to translate this into, you know, which refrigerator should we buy for the break room? Um, and we also leave students without a vocabulary for describing what skills they have, which, right, students will say, I'm an English major. They won't say, I know how to reason. I know how to express myself in writing. I know how to mm -hmm. communicate, blah, 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 right? And so I think that the focus on, this is part of another rant, of course, but, but the focus on content at, um, in some ways is, I think, really disadvantages students, right? Because it, it, we spend too little time saying, as you did, you know, um, how does this relate to other other use cases, so to speak, right? And and I think that very formulaic type of essay in which the process or the format dictates um, and often hides the lack of content, right? I mean, that students really have nothing to say, but they know exactly how to say it, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of really working to help students develop agency as writers, right? Mm -hmm. And to understand this, you know, and what I like about your project is that there's somebody at the other end of it, right? Because writing is ultimately about readers and did they understand what I was yeah. trying to say? You know, how did they react to it? What do they think? You know, and, and so on. And I just think that when we're spending so much great energy creating these new technological approaches to classic problems, we have an opportunity to rethink, you know, is the five paragraph essay really what we want to be devoting you know, our, our time to? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think we would probably get along <laughs> in terms of kind of conceptual <laughs> uh, approaches to education. So I have a couple of comments uh, that I noted down. Uh, and one is, yeah, and this won't be apparent in what I've showed you briefly, but if you really got uh, deep into the system, you would notice that the feedback is content agnostic. It was an intentional okay. decision not mm. to tie you know, his thesis statement feedback to Shakespeare. Uh, it's a technical possibility. I can tell you exactly how we would do it, but we chose not okay. to do it. And this type of thing is a big part of the reason. The technology is about this, the mechanical elements of writing. Right? The, and mm -hmm. it's not your thesis statement has to be the last sentence of your first paragraph. It just has to be a thesis statement, right? We look for that somewhere in the first paragraph. Uh, so the technology gives that type of uh, kind of just beat the students over the head with the ideas. The idea you need to state something clearly. You need to support it. You need to explain why your evidence is relevant to what you're saying. And that frees up the teacher to do exactly what you said we need to do. Because uh, that's what the teacher is there for in my mind, right? That expertise, that higher order stuff, that's what the human brain can give to young human brains if they try to go out and find their way in the world. And by lifting up the mechanical side of the equation from the teacher's responsibility, the, you know, the basic value proposition is, well, you can spend a little bit of your time working with students one-on-one -on -one or all of your time working with students one-on-one, -on -one, or most of it, right? I understand you they all have departmental meetings, uh, et cetera. And just as a, a kind of side technical note, another thing that is part of the technology that you didn't see in our kind of quick demonstrations uh, is that we provide teachers with some scaffolding around things like content, meaning that we break our scores down into what we call a mechanical score or a technical score and a content mm. score. So we're not doing it for you, it being thinking about content, but we did give you that quick flag. This is more or less on topic. So you don't have to worry about a student writing a very well-structured paper that's BS, right? We can catch that. Well, the technology can catch that. And it will tell you, the teacher, that if you know, something here isn't quite right, they might be messing with you. Can, can, those are my notes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to monopolize this, but can the technology help the student... I mean, I actually find, I've found that where students really have the most trouble is really understanding what it means to make an argument, right? It's not even expressing it so much as how do you take a stand on something that is really meaty enough to you know, be worth writing about. Can this technology help that in any way or? Uh, yeah, and I say that because, you know, we've looked at a lot of data thinking about these types of broader questions uh, yeah, it's good that Brian's paper on Shakespeare uh, got better beginning to end, right? But what happens if we look at Brian's writing skills over some longer term arc? I see. Uh, and the data is consistent across user level, across institution type, uh, that over time, yes, 
students are getting better, meaning they're writing more focused, more thoughtful, quote unquote, better organized uh, essays. Uh, so it seems highly likely uh, that, yes, the technology does that. Uh, and I say that, again, based on data, both our own internal studies and external studies that have then been validated by you know, data experts, third parties. So uh, we're very uh, data-driven creatures. We're researchers at our core. Uh, so we're, uh, we set some pretty high standards for ourselves in terms of what we're willing to say publicly. And all these claims that I'm making, you know, I, I've got the data in my electronic pocket. So I'm not just making it up, I promise. Uh, you're welcome to see it if you have to Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for an excellent, I excellent do. question. Um, uh, we have a few more questions coming up. And, um, and thank you, Jamie, for engaging so thoughtfully with this. Uh, quick yeah. question from uh, Gloria Dougherty, um, who asks, are there any accessibility limitations? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, and I'll, I'll sort of explain my, my tongue-in-cheek response. So we do uh, a regular accessibility audit every time we complete uh, what we would consider a medium to major update to the system. Uh, we do another VPAT and then make relevant changes so that we can have our, uh, we're WCAG 2. Point, or AA compliant uh, 2.0. Uh, so we take it seriously and we're constantly monitoring it. And if you're curious, our next scheduled review is during the, uh, the upcoming holiday break. So uh, mm. it's always possible that a, a minor change is created in an issue, but it would be a, a relatively short term before we would catch that and address that in our uh, consistent ADA review. Great. Uh, good question. And one that we really have to uh, always ask whenever it comes to any technology. Um, we have a question here from uh, Michael Haggins, and let me bring him up. Um, he's just down the road from you, relatively speaking, at uh, Georgia Tech Center for 21st Century Universities. Michael, can you hear us? Okay. I can. Can you hear me? It's great to see you again. Good to see you. Um, well, my question, Jamie, is about scalability. Uh, you mentioned in your introductory remarks your inability as an instructor to scale yourself. Um, so I'd like you to comment on that general uh, question and what you see from the development work that you've done and the applications. How do you, how do you feel scalability plays in your particular program and others that uh, may be simultaneously arising? Uh, yeah, that's no, a great question. Uh, and I have sort of a two-part answer. One is the conceptual answer and one is the, the technical answer. And I'll start with the technical answer because that one's easier. Uh, so you know, there's no theoretical limit to how much we can process at any one time. You know, if you organized 100,000 papers to come in at exactly the same time, our Amazon architecture would spin up extra servers, uh, and you shouldn't notice any more than a very, very minor lag uh, in terms of real-time process. And you might go from 0.3 seconds to 0.7 seconds or 1.2 seconds. Uh, but you know, it's great. Amazon does all that. I don't know how that works. but And we tested this, and we, you know, we run scripts where we'll have 25,000 people hitting a key a second for an hour just to see if we can break the system. Uh, and wow. we have not broken it yet. Uh, so, you know, the, the educational understanding of scalability, uh, it, you know, when I said I don't scale, meaning I, I'm bound by time, obviously, but I'm also bound by my human reality. Right? I get tired, I get bored, I have an extra drink, my team loses. Uh, and just as an aside, we've studied the impact of all these things anecdotally. Uh, and students, the optimal time if your teacher is drinking while grading is two drinks, uh, because the third drink uh, in introduces enough variability that you might encounter a mean teacher. Uh, so at two, they've relaxed. At three, they might relax more. They might get upset. Uh, if your team loses, it's about a four-point penalty. Uh, yeah, but the, the broad point here is, we are all incredibly variable, even if we're experts. And you know, what I like to tell people who push me on this point is, you know, let's say that it's a human expert versus the algorithm, whatever that means, one-on-one. -on -one. So we're going to give a paper to a human expert, let him or her grade it, and then let the algorithm grade it. Uh, I'm going to put my money on the human in that sense, but that's not like any educational environment I've ever encountered. If I'm a high school teacher and I've got five sections with 25 students apiece, so I'm looking at 100 plus papers a weekend, 
you know, who's your money on in terms of depth of feedback, in terms of consistency, et cetera. Uh, so scaling uh, engagement feedback within an educational context is what I was getting at more in that comment about my own scalability at the outset. Does that answer your question? Uh, Two part answer, it's, I guess. It's, yeah, it's, it's getting there. It's a, it's a difficult problem as we negotiate the hybridization of classes that used to be only face to face and move into a zone where they're face to face and using other um, instrumentality or, or techniques or programs. And, and so uh, I guess I just ask again how you how you think about that philosophically as a teacher and particularly thinking about future applications of the of the program and the software that you and your colleagues are developing it in terms of what its implications are sure uh yeah i've wrestled with this because i came out of uh, again a very old school way of approaching education yeah. Uh, so I'm not the technologist from the future out to get the robots to take over. Uh, but I have thought a lot about it. Uh, and sort of my mindset is if something can be automated in a way that provides uh, you know, consistency, a greater efficiency, that's a good thing. So long as part of that trade-off in introducing that technology is that the teacher's obligations will shift to do more of the things that the computer can't do. You know, simplistically, uh, the deal I like to offer teachers when I present live is, you, know, you never have to grade a paper again if you don't want to. As a consequence of that choice, you have to commit to five extra hours of face-to-face -face time with your students a week. Right? So this isn't making all educational engagement go away. I just want you okay. to do the thing that are not algorithmic. Because if you do the computer plus more face-to-face -face time, in almost every instance, the student who has that hybrid uh, type of engagement is going to learn the skill uh, with more depth and more efficiently than uh, someone who's doing uh, one or the other. Uh, so yeah. part of this philosophically, to use your term, is uh, being honest about what technology can do and being willing to hand over some things to technology that we're used to handling ourselves, but you know, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, expertise and human insight and engagement has been proven to have a significantly positive impact for hundreds and hundreds of years. We don't want to lose yeah. sight of that. The robots are not coming for us. We just want to find the optimal balance between what technology does really well that humans don't do so well, and uh, obviously the flip of that. What do humans do that technology can't do? Great. Great Thank question. you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have a stack of other questions, and uh, I, I want to bring these up um, just really quickly. Some of them uh, are deeper, and some of them are very instrumental. Um, another question about accessibility, uh, and this is from uh, Susan Perry, uh, who asks, uh, as I understand it, you still cannot address the visually impaired. Is that correct? Uh, meaning, uh, can you clarify? I think I know the what you're asking, but I want to make sure I'm... Uh, actually yeah. answering what you're asking about. Susan, if, if you could say more, either just uh, raise your hand if you want to join us in video or just put in another question uh, in, to follow up. Um, so we can come back, we circle right back to that. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Reese McDevitt um, who asks, uh, how can this program be used with other writing programs, Mission Grammarly, other services, Writing Center, to ensure a success of on-ground blended and online students? especially remedial students. Reese is in Chicago, I think, Nashville Lewis. Cool. Uh, now, great question. Because uh, you know, a lot of what we are thinking about these days is how do we play nice with other systems now that our system is kind of you know, to the starting line and stable. Uh, so for something like Grammarly, uh, as I mentioned, if you want spelling and grammar help, that's a far better technology to use. And our solution to that is... Uh, and this is on our staging server, and we're testing it. So it'll be in the actual system here for the next couple of weeks, uh, is to update our front-end package, uh, you know, which is what allows our technology to work across different browsers and devices. And the package that we are implementing allows the Grammarly plugin to function within the Acree environment. Uh, so you'll get to have your cake and eat it too once that update is complete, if you're a Grammarly type of person. Uh, 
in terms of other you know, platforms, LMSs, uh, these sorts of things, we have a solid LTI integration. So in theory, we should be able to plug and play with uh, whatever other environments are out there. And if you don't have an LTI integration, we have an API. So again, it's fairly straightforward to hook different systems together. Uh, the specifics of an integration, especially if it involves the API, uh, there's more context uh, relevant things I would have to ask you about. But uh, the basic answer is, uh, we want to be integratable, if that's a word, uh, with as many platforms as possible. Unfortunately, there are well-established tools that make that easy most of the time. Uh, there's always some gremlins in the occasional use case, but we've gotten better at heading off the gremlins. Well, speaking of gremlins and other uh, and other creatures, we have uh, the splendid creature of a student, uh, Charlie Doyle, who asks a question that has to do with uh, the question of um, of staffing. Is could your system be used in combination with a grad student who teaches a writing class? If you could eliminate the need for an expensive English professor in every class, the price of a writing course uh, he was cut off then, but I think he was going to say the price of writing course would go down. Uh, the answer is yes. And that's one of the clearly quantified values of using the technology in an introductory level course. And it's a pretty, it's probably the most common approach to the technology is, you know, situations where you've got sections upon sections of the same course uh, taught by a wide swath of uh, individuals. How do you ensure consistency across that? And uh, at the institutional level, providing that formative engagement does create greater efficiencies in terms of how you deploy human labor. So uh, the answer is yes. And then the kind of less detailed answer is <clears throat> uh, we have TAs who use it all the time. That's a good uh, answer. Because they benefit the most, right? They generally have the most work to do with respect to grading, at least in higher ed. Um, Charlie, that's a great question and uh, a very, very uh, uh, powerful answer. Jamie. Uh, again, I'm impressed at the range of institutions that you get to work with. Uh, we had um, another question um, that comes up from, uh, let's see, oh, this is actually a question that actually kind of helps wrap this up. Uh, this is from Dan Lasota again, and Dan wants to know, it looks fairly easy to set this up, and now I'm wondering about demos. Any chance we could try it out with about 10 designers? This is Dan at uh, uh, University of Alabama, I think. Yeah, sure. Uh, the best uh, two-part answer, one is we have a clearly defined pilot program, so if you're free to reach out. And then the second part is, uh, if, I'm, if I do this correctly, I'll just type my uh, email into the box. Uh, feel free to reach out. You know, I don't want to take up everybody's time uh, answering these sort of straightforward questions, but feel free to reach out, and we can walk through stuff like that offline. Well, this, this is actually a good bridge, because we are at the last minute of the session. And this is a bridge to the question I always like to ask, which is, Jamie, how do we stay in touch with you? How do we keep up with the create? Uh, Email is the best way. I think I included my Twitter handle and my login information, but I don't use Twitter all that often. I don't think I fully understand it. Uh, and that's my own <laughs> shortcoming, a critique of the platform. I just don't know how to tweet well, whatever that might mean. Uh, so email is the best way to get in touch with me. You can probably you know get to me through LinkedIn. Um, Etc. And I'm always, I spend too much time answering email, probably. So uh, I'm usually pretty good about getting back to folks. Uh, if you do okay, reach out, uh, to you, oh, sorry, just say, please let me know where you got my email so I can connect it in my brain. Uh, but so otherwise, yeah, that's J A M E Y at ecre e c r e e dot com. And of course, you can go to e c r e e dot com to uh, get case studies and more information about this. Um, Jamie, let me thank you so much. This is a tremendous, tremendous project. Very, very exciting with all kinds of possibilities. And I'm just so, so glad that you've had the chance to talk with us about it. Oh, no, happy to be here. And thanks, everyone, for your, your questions. It's good to get the old brain fired up in the afternoon. Usually it goes the other way where I start to, to check out about this time of day. So I had a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Or you could suffer from your brain freezing in case things get too cold. It's balmy here compared to where others are. I'm, I'm <laughs> really 
Well, thank you again. Thank you. And uh, friends, stick around for just one more minute uh, because I need to show you what's happening for the next week. Uh, so first of all, uh, next week on the 13th, we have Ryan Craig. Uh, he's managing director at University Ventures, uh, but he's also the author of a new book called A New You, which is a powerful vision of a new way to organize higher education. So please join us for that discussion. Uh, in the meantime, between now and then, uh, we're continuing our read of Zainab Tufeshki's Twitter and Tear Gas. Uh, we are deep into her analysis of how people use social media uh, to organize political dissent and political protest. It's a very engaging read, and it's obviously of so much importance for right now. If you'd like to find out about either of those books um, or grab a copy, uh, go to our bookstore. Let's go to brianalexander.org slash bookstore and check out the only bookstore on earth dedicated to the future of higher education. You can find books there. Hint, hint, it is the Christmas season coming up. So if you'd like to get more, every purchase offers a little bit of support to the future transform. Now, if you'd like to keep up the conversation as we go, we're all over social media, so you can keep up with our conversation on the hashtag FTDE on Twitter, where people have been issuing thoughts so far during the past hour. You can find our groups on Slack, LinkedIn, and Facebook, and you can find myself and Shindig on Twitter as well. In the meantime, let me thank you all so much for your great conversation. Thank you to our guest, Jamie, for his wonderful thoughts on this really fascinating project, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.